take a uh, brief few minutes just to introduce our panel today, and then our problem editor is going to take a few minutes to introduce the problem, uh, give an overview of the facts and the issues so you know what everybody is talking about up here. Um, for our chief justice, we have Judge Griffith from the DC Circuit. He was appointed to the United States Court of Appeals in June of 2005. Uh, he graduated undergrad from Brigham Young University and then graduated law school from UVA Law. He was engaged in private practice from 1985 to 1995 and again in 1999, first in Charlotte, North Carolina, where he was an associate at Robinson, Bradshaw, and Hinson, and later in Washington, D.C., where he was an associate and then a partner at Wiley, Ryan, and Fielding. His primary areas of emphasis were commercial and corporate litigation and government investigations. From 1995 to 99, Judge Griffith was Senate Legal Counsel of the United States. In that capacity, he represented the interests of the Senate in litigation and advised the Senate leadership and its committees on investigations, including the impeachment trial of President Clinton. 2000 until his appointment to the United States Court of Appeals, Judge Griffith was assistant to the president and general counsel of Brigham Young University. In 1999 to 2000, Judge Griffith was general counsel to the Advisory Commission on Electronic Commerce, a congressional commission created to study the interplay between tax policy and electronic commerce. From 02 to 03, Judge Griffith served as a member of the United States Secretary of Education's Commission on Opportunity in Athletics, which examined the role of Title IX in intercollegiate athletics. Judge Griffith has long been active at the American Bar Association's Central European and Eurasian Law Initiative. He currently serves on the Seeley Council of the ABA's Rule of Law Initiative and on the Board of Directors of the Seeley Institute in Prague. Since joining the court, Judge Griffith has taught courses on presidential powers and judicial process at the Brigham Young University Law School and on the role of Article III judges at Stanford Law School. So that's our chief judge. To his right will be uh, Judge Pamela Reeves from the Eastern District of Tennessee. She graduated cum laude from uh, the University of Tennessee with a Bachelor of Arts in 1976. Then she received a Juris Doctor in 1979 from the George C. Taylor College of Law at the University of Tennessee. From 1979 to 1985, she worked as an associate at the law firm of Griffin, Burkhalter, Cooper, and Reeves. And from 1985 to 87, as an associate at Morrison, Morrison, Tyree, and Dickinson. From 87 to 02, she worked at the law firm of Watson, Hollow, and Reeves and then formed the law firm of Reeves, Herbert, and Anderson in Knoxville. From, from 1998 to 1999, she served as the first woman president of the Tennessee Bar Association. She served as the secretary of the Knoxville Bar Association, the president of the Knoxville Barristers, and the president of the TBA, that's the Tennessee Bar Association, Young Lawyers Division. She was elected as a national trustee of the American Inns of Court Foundation and has also served as five years as the chair of the Knoxville Election Commission. She's been publicly recognized by her peers in legal and leadership skills. She is the recipient of the Knoxville Bar Association's Governor's Award, the highest award offered by the Knoxville Bar Association, and has been listed as one of the top 100 lawyers in the state of Tennessee and the best lawyers of America list from 2006 to 2011. She's uh, also served as an adjunct professor at the University of Tennessee College of Law and has been a frequent speaker at continuing legal education events. Finally, the judge on the left will be Judge Roy McLeese for the District of Columbia Court of Appeals. He was appointed in 2002. He received his Bachelor of Arts cum laude in 1981 from Harvard and his JD cum laude again in 1985 from the New York University School of Law where he was editor in chief of the Law Review. After graduating from law school, Judge McLeese served as a law clerk to then Judge Anton Scalia on the United States Court of Appeals for the District Circuit 
Columbia. He then clerked for Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court of the United States. In 1987, Judge McLeish joined the United States Attorney Office for the District of Columbia. After rotating through various sections of that office, he became Deputy Chief of the Appellate Division in 1990. From 1997 through 1999, Judge McLeish served as an assistant to the Solicitor General of the United States, briefing and arguing cases in the Supreme Court. After returning to the United States Attorney's Office, he became Chief of the Appellate Division in 2005. In 2010, Judge McLeish served for five months as Acting Deputy Solicitor of the United States, supervising the criminal litigation of the United States in the Supreme Court. He then returned to the United States Attorney's Office, where he again served as Chief of the Appellate Division until he was appointed to the D.C. Court of Appeals. While working in the DOJ, Judge McLeese received the Attorney General's Distinguished Service Award and the John Marshall Award for Outstanding Legal, legal Achievement for Handling Appeals. He also received the Harold Sullivan and John Evans Awards from the Assistant United States Attorneys Association. Sorry that took so long, but they're very distinguished people and we're very glad to have them. Um, at this point, uh, Colin Downs is gonna give a brief overview of the problem and then uh, we'll kick it off. Colin. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Colin Downs, I'm the problem author. So this morning's case is US versus Estate of Slynn. I'm gonna just lay out the factual and procedure, uh, the, facts, uh, the facts of the matter and the procedural history. Gordon Slynn was a financial engineer at Minor Capital, a proprietary trading firm. He was employed as a developer and manager of an automated high-frequency trading platform and was responsible for a trading account active in the interest rate swaps derivatives market. When his trading account's performance began to decline, Slynn applied an unauthorized software patch to the automated trading platform. At Slynn's direction, the platform then engaged in a series of risky trades in an effort to improve Slynn's returns and boost his performance-based compensation. Slynn also orchestrated the manipulation of Minor Capital's internal record keeping to conceal his risky trades from the firm. Eventually, the risky positions were discovered. Slynn had exposed Minor Capital to well over a billion dollars in potential losses, and the firm was forced to immediately unwind these positions at substantial cost. Slynn blamed the episode on a software bug in the automated trading platform. Slynn's malfeasance was discovered by the firm through a protracted and expensive internal investigation. The firm terminated Slynn's employment and reported him to the authorities. The United States subsequently filed wire fraud charges against Slynn in the United States District Court for the District of Lyle, to which he pled guilty. The Mandatory Victim Restitution Act of 1996, or MVRA, requires restitution for a victim's losses upon conviction for certain crimes. Therefore, in addition to a prison sentence, upon Slynn's conviction, the trial court entered a restitution order, requiring that he repay the cost of unwinding his risky trades, as well as the accounting, legal, and other costs incurred by his employer during its investigation. Slynn appealed from this order on the grounds that the MVRA does not provide restitution for the cost of an independent internal investigation. There's an open circuit split on this question. During dependency of Slynn's appeal, he committed suicide in prison. Typically, in a criminal proceeding, the death of a defendant during an appeal abates the criminal case ab initio. Consequently, Slynn's widow has intervened on behalf of the decedent's estate, moved that the case be abated, and that the district court restitution order be vacated. However, a further circuit split has emerged as to whether or not such orders should be abated by the death of a criminal defendant. Some courts have even concluded that suicide waives the right to an appeal. The 23rd Circuit Court of Appeals has set oral argument for this morning on both questions. Thank you. Good morning. Is the practice that the clerk will call the court, the case, or? Okay, call the case. Got how to make my chair work. <laughs> there we go. Good morning. Good morning, Chief Judge, Your Honors, and may it please the court. I am Nate Billhartz, and I am co-counsel for the appellant, the estate of Gordon Slynn. I will be arguing that the criminal restitution order abated when Mr. Slynn died during the pendency of his appeal. Then my colleague, Trevor Lovell, will argue that the $2.3 million in costs incurred in the course of an internal investigation are not recoverable under the MVRA. I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Before I begin, would you like a brief statement of the facts? I think they're well put in the brief, so press ahead. Neither Mr. Slynn nor his estate 
gained anything from the conduct that led to these proceedings. Mr. Slynn applied the unauthorized software patch in an effort to restore his professional reputation and to regain lost profits. I, I don't have that much familiarity with uh, derivatives and, and, and this sort of work. How, how was he compensated? I didn't, I didn't understand that. Well, he was compensated based on the profitability of his various trading accounts. Now, the trading account in was, question... It wasn't the number of trades or anything of that nature? It was just the profitability of the trades? Uh, Your Honor, the number of trades would certainly have been associated with his overall compensation. His compensation was reduced after, at the end of 2013, uh, by which time his fully automated trading platform had lost a significant portion of the profits and, that it had And again, made. what is an interest rate swap for a derivative? I, I don't know that. Uh, well, Your Honor, I'm not an expert on this matter either, but uh, what we're discussing today is the result of his application of the unauthorized software patch to the trading platform and his uh, subsequent termination from Minor Capital as a result. Yeah, I understand your point. He didn't actually get away with gaining anything, but he was trying to, I don't know if he was going to actually get back into the black, but he was at least trying to avoid uh, personal economic losses by what he did. Is that right? Yes, Your Honor, that's correct. However, does it matter to the abatement issue whether he, uh, you know, what his purpose was? Well, Your Honor, for the question of abatement, the primary concerns are whether the finality principle and whether the punishment rationale persuade this court that abatement should apply to the restitution order in this case. Uh, now, we argue that this court should find that the order abated when he died during the pendency of his appeal for three main reasons. First, the finality principle, one of the primary justifications for abatement doctrine urges a finding that all criminal proceedings against a defendant are extinguished when the defendant dies pending appeal. Second. But Mr. Bilhart, doesn't that only apply if the conviction itself is being appealed? In this case, my understanding was he was not appealing the conviction. He was just appealing the order of restitution. Your Honor, it's true that the only thing being appealed in this case was the restitution order. However, the same rationale that applies when an underlying conviction has been appealed applies to the enforcement of a criminal order, such as an award of restitution under the MVRA. Is, it, is that your strongest argument, the finality principle? If this court remains unpersuaded by the finality principle and the reputational harm... No, no, no. I, I, what's your strongest argument and your assessment of this? Your strongest argument. You, that's what you led with in your briefs. And I was surprised because on the next issue, you lead with the plain language of the statute. That's correct. And you have a plain language argument on the abatement, but that's not your strongest? Well, turning to the plain language argument. No, 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 no. I know the argument. I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about the sequencing and, and what you think ought to be the most important and persuasive argument for us. Well, Your Honor, the circuit courts to have addressed the question of orders of restitution in the context of abatement uh, have relied heavily on the finality principle, both the Fifth Circuit in the United States v. Parsons and the Ninth Circuit in the United States v. And Rich. you think that's a more compelling argument than your plain ang language argument about the use of the word penalty in the statute? No, Your Honor. I would argue that the punitive rationale is the more important one for the... Per for, yeah, uh, if, for if it's punitive, you win, right? I mean, if, if That's this, correct, Your Honor. And you've got a language in the statute that says penalty. Yes, Your Honor. I would have thought that that would have... I mean, frankly, I don't care what the common law is. Congress has spoken. And if Congress has spoken... Uh, so tell me about the penalty argument. Well, that's correct, Your Honor. The plain language of the statute refers to restitution being issued in addition to or in lieu of any other penalty authorized by law. By referring to restitution and then to other penalties, the legislature strongly implies that it considered restitution a penalty. But that's not the only textual evidence that we have for the legislature's opinion on whether restitution is punitive or compensatory. In section 3664, the statute governing the enforcement of restitution orders, in subsection J2, the legislature refers to a later civil judgment, the amount of which would be subtracted from the uh, order of criminal restitution. It also refers to this amount as compensatory, the amount of the civil judgment. It never uses the word compensatory when referring to an order of restitution. Now also, the fact that a later civil judgment could be subtracted from the order of restitution should lead this court to conclude that the remaining amount of the order of restitution can only be serving a punitive purpose. It is oh, you say only serving a punitive purpose. Would you, you would agree. I mean, the restitution is payable to the victim. That is correct, Your Honor. And would you agree that the reason that's true is because there is a purpose to compensate the victim for the losses occasioned by the defendant's criminal conduct? Yes, Your Honor. We do not argue that the, an order of criminal restitution serves no compensatory purpose whatsoever. Well, I thought when you said it was only punitive, I guess uh, it led me to think you were running in that direction. But you would agree that it has also a uh, compensatory function. 
Your Honor, when I said only punitive, I was referring to the hypothetical situation envisioned by the legislature in Section 3664J2 when it refers to a later civil judgment being subtracted from the order of criminal restitution. In that event, the order of criminal restitution would seem to clearly be serving an extra compensatory purpose, uh, which we can only assume would be punitive in that case. Uh, now, Your Honor, the uh, circuit courts to have addressed this issue, uh, in addition to relying on the plain language of the statute, which indicates that restitution is considered a penalty, have also acknowledged that restitution is neither fish nor fowl. It is neither entirely compensatory nor entirely punitive. In fact, it would be impossible to separate exactly what percentage of an order of restitution is compensatory and which percentage is punitive, and it's unnecessary. If, 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 it, if, it, if it is compensatory, um, doesn't that purpose get eviscerated if we treat it as you want us to treat it, as, as, a, as, as, a, as a penalty? No, Your Honor, because the victim How, how does the victim get protected? Well, the victim corporation has, a, has an avenue to access those funds, and that would be a civil judgment. Uh, to, award, to issue an, an order of criminal restitution when the defendant has died during the, during the pendency of an appeal would be both to deny the defendant the protection from reputational harms that the finality principle suggests she should have. Well, if, if you agree that restitution has in part a compensatory purpose, uh, the idea that there is restitution suggests that Congress felt that leaving victims as their sole avenue of uh, compensation, civil lawsuits, was not ideal. And it was intended to be, I th uh, do you agree, uh, a streamlined way, one of its purposes was to be a streamlined way for victims to be able to get compensation more quickly without having to go through civil litigation. Yes, Your Honor. One of the purposes was to streamline the litigation. But in the context of criminal proceedings, we can't be concerned about efficiency at the expense of the other core concerns in our criminal justice system. What, could you explain, what, assuming that the um, uh, defendant's uh, state is permitted to come in and litigate the question of whether the state should lose the funds or not, uh, what's the unfairness or what's the core concern that you think is implicated by the position that your opponents take? What, why is that, that system sort of fundamentally unfair in some way? Well, for one thing, the defendant has not exhausted his right to an appeal. He is being denied his right to have his case heard on appeal. No, but if it... And he also voluntarily put himself in suicide. Your Honor, Appley's contention that a, a failure to carve out an exception for suicide in abatement doctrine uh, because without such an exception, defendants such as Mr. Slynn might be encouraged to commit suicide in order to secure a windfall to their estate, uh, frankly flies in the face of everything that we know about suicide. Uh, the mental health literature is unanimous in finding a very close association between suicide. Counsel, what, what do you think your weakest point is in your argument? And uh, what, what's the biggest hurdle you have to overcome? And, uh, and how do you overcome it? Well, Your Honor, one of the biggest challenges was the relative uh, paucity of cases in which a defendant has appealed only the restitution order and then died during the pendency of that appeal. However, the same rationale that would support abatement of, a, of an underlying criminal conviction. Is that a weakness in your argument, or is that just the novelty of the, the fact pattern here? It, it was a bit of both, Your Honor. Uh, it's, it's more difficult to argue when we don't have cases directly on point about just an appeal of a restitution order. I would, th I would think the toughest challenge you've got uh, is the one that uh, Judge McLeese referred to, and that is there's clearly a compensatory uh, component to this. Uh, and, and your best response to that is? That there is also a punitive component. And when we are enforcing a punitive component, uh, in, instead of simply going for the, the civil judgment avenue, which is also available uh, to the victim corporation and which was specifically contemplated by the legislature, as they make clear in Section 3664, it's an... So your, your idea that, well, it's 51% penal, therefore we have to treat it. Your Honor, it's not possible to separate out exactly right, what... Right, right. Isn't that the problem? It's not possible. And Congress clearly had a compensatory uh, goal in mind. So is your answer to that, your best answer to that, civil judgment? They can Go elsewhere. A civil judgment would be the appropriate avenue for minor cat. Isn't another way of looking at it that uh, if the choice is uh, punish someone who uh, uh, has passed away uh, and allow his estate to litigate the question of the fairness of that punishment as it relates to the fairness of compensating the victims uh, and uh, compensate the living, why isn't the, the better way of balancing all the interests to allow the estate to come in 
litigate the fairness of the compensation order as it relates to, uh, or the restitution order as it relates to the rights of people who are still living. And that will also uh, permit litigation on appeal about whatever issues may uh, exist about the legal, the legal basis for the conviction. What, what's wrong with that system? I think there are two answers to that, Your Honor. First, while Mrs. Slynn, who has stepped into her husband's shoes, does have a similar financial interest in preserving the estate uh, to the interest that her husband would have had, reputational interests are highly personal. That's something that's recognized by all courts relying on the finality rationale and applying abatement. Mr. Slynn had... It, it, why would we be more concerned about the reputation of someone who chose to commit suicide rather than continue the litigation uh, if we're balancing that against the compensation of a victim? Uh, why would you think you would favor the reputational interest of the deceased over the compensatory interest of the living? Well, Your Honor, I'd like to address the appellee's contention that an exception should be carved out for suicides to abatement doctrine. A 2003 study published in the peer-reviewed uh, publication uh, Psychological Medicine found that in over 90% of suicides, the person committing suicide was suffering from mental illness. Do, do we know that about uh, Mr. Slynn here? What do we know about the circumstances surrounding his death? Uh, we do not. The record contains no information about the mental health history of Mr. Slynn. However, Your Honor, what the court is contemplating today is whether or not to carve out a general rule, an exception for suicide to abatement doctrine. And when crafting- how general your rule would be. Imagine that uh, the, uh, the defendant here had left a note saying, the reason I'm committing suicide is because I want my, you know, my wife to have this money and I want to stick it to the victim one more time. Would that make a difference to you or are you ad ad advocating a flat rule that no matter what the circumstances of the suicide, it's always abatement uh, ab initio? Your Honor, a very narrow exception for cases where it can be conclusively proven that the defendant committed suicide with a clearly stated intent to secure a windfall to his estate through application of abatement doctrine to the order of restitution, uh, allowing an exception for that was not something that we would oppose. But those are not the facts of this case. What we're talking about is a general exception for suicide, which is something that would not be supported by the mental health literature, which strongly suggests that people contemplating suicide are not responding to rational incentives in the same way that a person who is not mentally ill would be. And Why Michael, why isn't it well, Your Honor, the, the Third Circuit says United States v. Christopher or United States v. DeMichael? The, uh, well, Your Honor, the Eleventh Circuit was contemplating a case of suicide as well in the context of abatement. And it specifically found that suicide was irrelevant uh, to the question of abatement. Now, I see that I'm out of time. May I briefly conclude? Sure, you can finish the answer to this question. Your Honor, DeMichael is not controlling because there's a contrary precedent from other circuits. And in fact, on the question of whether, whether restitution orders can abate in the event of defendant's death, there are more circuits saying that they can than specifically saying that they can't. For these reasons, this court should find that the order abated. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Chief Judge, Your Honors, may it please the court, I am Trevor Lovell and I am co-counsel to the appellant in this matter, the estate of Gordon Slynn. I will be arguing that the district court below erred by including $2.3 million in its restitution order related to investigatory expenses incurred by minor capital, the victim of the crime, under the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act, Title 18, Section 3663A, B4, which I will refer to as Section B4. Let me ask you a factual question. Um, everyone agrees that it took eight and a half million dollars to undo the damage Mr. Slynn had done. Uh, but, but what was the damage and why did it cost them eight, eight and a half million dollars to fix? I didn't quite understand that. Yes, Your Honor. Um, because Mr. Slynn pled guilty, there was not a, a, a detailed factual record with respect to that particular question. However, it appears that what happened is Mr. Slynn's program uh, created unnecessary or unauthorized risk in, uh, with respect to Minor Capital's assets. Minor Capital then had to spend eight and a half million dollars to unwind those investments, to make contrary trades in order to get its risk portfolio back where it desired. And that's what I'm getting at. We don't know what that means. We just know that they spent eight and a half million dollars to 
to it's fix not it. made clear. Presumably, it was something to the effect of uh, they may have lost on those trades, um, having to make the trades to get back to their original Jeez. position. And what about the police position that the nothing in the record that supports the I'm not sure. Are you referring to, to Appley's contention? App Appellant's contention is that there is nothing in the record to support it. Your position. Explain why you think that. Yes, John. Because the court below did not investigate whatsoever whether or not these costs were necessary, as it had an obligation to do, especially provided that Mr. Slynn contested the $2.3 million, the court clearly erred by including the entire amount, the full $2.3 million, without asking a single question about whether those costs actually met the statutory language that requires those to be necessarily incurred in order for the, for the victim to participate in the investigation. Is it your view that necessary is being used in its very strong sense of absolutely essential or in its sometimes uh, weaker sense, like in the necessary and proper clause of reasonable and appropriate. What's your, what's your view about how most that should be understood? Most likely, Your Honor, necessary would take on the, the weaker of the two. And it's simply not necessary to decide that question because even under the sort of uh, broader interpretation of the word necessary, the district court below simply did nothing to look into the necessity of these expenses. So even if this court does not agree with the appellant's interpretation of the law, the court clearly erred and the decision must be reversed and remanded. How many circuits have looked at this issue? At the uh, question of the, the legal interpretation? Right, right, uh, yeah. Yes, Your Honor. Um, a number of circuit courts have done so. Um, I believe it is six circuits. And only one has taken the view that you're urging us? Yes, Your Honor. So, only so you're asking us to, uh, to follow the D.C. Circuit? Yes, Your Honor. Now, generally, that's a good move. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but, but, wh but where, where in the plain language of the statute does it say that the, gov that the investigation must be a government investigation? Your Honor, there are a number of indications, if you read Section B-4 as a whole, there are a number of indications that Congress was attempting to limit the scope of Section B-4 and only anticipated that official investigations would be covered. One of the... But let's start with the most obvious point. They didn't say official investigation, did they? That is correct, Your Honor. A lot of trouble could That's have been problem. saved. That's yes. a problem. I mean, it's a problem for your argument, right? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. However, if we look at the end of the provision, it says... Uh, the investigation or prosecution of the offense. Now, the offense is clearly a crime. We're in Title 18, and furthermore, the MVRA only applies to criminal convictions. So what we're talking about when we talk about an investigation and a prosecution is the criminal investigation, the criminal prosecution. Now, private parties... To be clear, if, if the uh, way this had begun, instead of the company doing its internal investigation and self-reporting, is that the SEC had found out about it and had started a civil investigation, and the company had been uh, drawn into that investigation and it had uh, generated expenses in connection with that investigation, your view is those would not be compensable under this provision because that was not, at the time, a criminal investigation? I see, Your Honor. That question was actually addressed by the Southern District of New York in United States v. Gupta. Now, while the Second Circuit precedent does hold that all internal investigations are covered, um, by Section B-4, it was dealing there with the, a, a joint SEC and FBI investigation. And it said to the extent that there was uh, government uh, participation and overlap between the two investigations, that, that, that it was indistinguishable effectively which part should be included as... And, and, uh, and is your position that you agree with that aspect of the Second Circuit, so it's not required that the investigation be criminal in character as long as it is official? I think, Your Honor, that's just a much closer case that would be a little bit harder to distinguish out. And it's your position with respect to that case? My position would be that it's still an official investigation and probably something that Congress was anticipating would be covered. To the extent that... And just to push a little further down the road, if it had been, uh, imagine instead the way the issue would come to light is that a, a congressional subcommittee got interested in the topic and started investigating and the company uh, generated expenses. Would that right. be fine too? Well, a, a distinction starts to be drawn. Much of what the SEC engages in is, of course, it, it, it's all civil. However, what they're looking into is a civil side of often criminal acts. So 
I think that a distinction could be made between those two cases, and again, that case becomes, it becomes harder and harder to justify that Congress anticipated something like a, a congressional committee looking into a particular situation. I mean, that just underscores the, the, the problem with it. Uh, they, they just use the word investigation, and that's very broad, and you want us to read it in a more limited fashion, and I just don't understand the basis for that. Well, there are, again, a number of terms in the statute that indicate... The offense. What are some of the others? You've used the offense. In your brief, I believe, you, you talked about the singular use of the word investigation. Yes, sir. So Honor. what happens when there are multiple investigations? FBI is looking at it, SEC is looking at it, and uh, the House Oversight Committee is looking at it. Does your argument fall apart then? No, Your Honor. Those would still be uh, official investigations, and the fact that, that the singular is used is, is merely to indicate that Congress... Uh, anticipated that it would be the investigation of the offense. Just because there are three investigations of the offense doesn't mean that each one is not the investigation of the offense. So, so in a way, that's your opponent's argument, is there were really four, if you're thinking of the hypothetical we just had, which was the company's internal investigation first. Right. I stop at three. Again, Your Honor, some of the uh, uh, additional limiting language within the statute itself indicates that um, what Congress is anticipating was official investigations and not private elective investigations. If we think about the implications of Appley's position, in fact, they're even described in the brief, we're asking this court, Appley rather, is asking this court to read the statute to, uh, to encourage and incentivize private parties to engage in vigilante investigation of criminal acts. See, vigil vigilante is a pretty strong term. I, uh, led to a clear determination that there has been. Yes, Your Honor, but again, this court is going to craft a rule in interpretation of Section B-4. Now, the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act does not just cover wire fraud cases like this one where an investigation might be relatively safe. It also covers crimes of violence and property crimes. So if this court adopts a rule that Section B-4 was designed to incentivize victims of crimes to go and investigate. The, the Apple uses the word outsource in its brief. Outsource the investigations of crimes to private parties, and not only private parties, but aggrieved victims of crimes. That would, that would seem, one, a fairly irresponsible policy on the part of Congress. And uh, uh, it, it, it's a difficult burden to argue that interpreting the statute the way your opponents say it should be interpreted will have drastic, unacceptable consequences if Five circuits have adopted the, that interpretation, and at least as far as anybody can tell, we, we haven't, uh, the sky hasn't been falling in those circuits. Um, Your Honors, I would argue that the, uh, it, the logic of those decisions simply falls down to the extent that, that or the, and furthermore, that the logic of Appleby's argument falls down in the face of looking at the entire statute rather than looking merely at its application to a white-collar crime situation and looking at how the rule would have to be applied in other contexts, whether those, those uh, incentives... Let's talk about this case. You used the word... I'm struck by your use of the word vigilante. Is that what happened in this case? Do you think the investigation minor capital undertook was that of a vigilante? No, Your Honors. It's in this case, here, it seems... Right? I mean, it was, they did the right thing here. That's what we want people to do, isn't it? Yes, Your Honors. We do want, want uh, minor capital and parties in, in minor capital's position to do so. And, of course, they will probably do so whether or not the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act is in place. Minor capital had a fiduciary duty to look into how these trades got made, how these positions were taken. I'm sorry, Your Honor? No, I was agreeing with you, yeah. And so they're going to do so in, in, either, you know, in either case, whether or not the, the statute is there. The incentives that, that Appley relies on to undergird its argument are unnecessary in this context and dangerous in other contexts covered by the statute. I ask you about, uh, there, there's a case called Cummings, which you discuss in your brief, that uh, it, it seems in your brief you may be agreeing states a, cor a correct uh, aspect of the rule that you would accept which is if there is a clear statutory or other kind of framework that encourages private investigation, then perhaps it's permissible under the restitution provisions to uh, order restitution. Is that, so is that, is that your view if there is a clear enough structure where there is encouragement of private investigation, the statute can cover that? Your Honor, in Cummings and cases like Cummings, where there is a statutory framework that encourages private parties to take, in that case it was a private uh, suit to recover or the return of her children, um, the victim's children, 
In those cases, the victim is going to be working hand in hand with officials who are also investigating the criminal side of the same offense, of the same behavior. And that's exactly what this statute was designed to do with respect to victims Just to like- be clear, you agree that if a case has that form, the statute applies? Yes, Your Honor. If, if there is a clear statutory framework, and furthermore, what that framework is doing is creating an environment in which official investigators and private citizens are pursuing are pursuing essentially an overlapping investigation that is the same investigation. That's Actually, exactly- So is that, um, uh, one could argue, I, I, mean, I don't know what the magic of statutory is. I think it's, uh, you know, the Department of Justice has published guidelines about what, how, when it decides to prosecute corporations and when it doesn't. And a component of those guidelines, what it says to the corporations is, if you don't want to be held criminally prosecuted as a corporation, which is a death knell for a corporation, here's what you need to do. When you find out there's criminal activity by people, or potentially criminal, act, uh, criminal activity by your employees, you need to investigate it. You need to self-report. You need to give us the information so that we can figure out what to do. And so it's, I, I think it's, uh, it may not be statutory, but there's a pretty well-structured system of encouragement of precisely what the company did here. Yes, Your Honor, except that what the company should have done if it wanted to be covered under the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act was allowed federal investigators, federal officials to be in the driver's seat in order to determine the, appro the propriety of a criminal I investigation. Oh, we think somebody in our office. Well, again, Your Honor. Any, any corporation. I think that Congress has already balanced out those policy incentives, and it has looked at the situation where if it has an overbroad scope to Section B4, again, we get an, a, a situation that we don't want. We have, we have effectively vigilante investigation by private parties. On the other hand, if it's drawn too narrowly, certain costs may not be recoverable by some victims. But it's important to remember that the Mandatory Victim Restitution Act extends a benefit to victims. It's not taking anything away from them simply because the, the scope of the statute is narrowly tailored to situations where Congress wants to take the discretion away from the court and order that the restitution be provided um, with, without regard to equitable considerations and equitable defenses. So, Your Honors, again, minor capital can always go into civil court to, to recover these costs. And in fact, prior to 1996, when the MVRA was passed, that's it clear that uh, 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 what cause of action do you have in mind in what court? What's the, could you tell me what you think the structure of that cause of action would be that would allow them to recover this kind of investigative expense? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I see my time is up. Go ahead. Um, in that case, what a, a party like Minor Capital would argue is that as a consequence of the crime, the fraud committed against it, a, a direct and foreseeable consequence of that was the expenditure of the, um, of the $2.3 million in investigation costs. And if we look at some of the other court precedents that are cited in the brief at pages 14 through 17, those are the kinds of actions that um, the Eighth Circuit in Akbani, for example, contemplated um, Section B1 of the MVRA covering. If you look at Section B1, it looks like an ordinary tort um, action to return property. Let me, I know we're out of time, but I, uh, a question I want to ask you, and each of the uh, participants will see a pattern, each of the uh, advocates will see a pattern here. What do you think is your greatest hurdle to overcome in, in, in your argument, and how do you overcome it? I think Your Honor hit it from the very beginning. Uh, the fact that Congress simply did not put the word official in creates unnecessary ambiguity. Thank you, Your Honors. Okay, we'll hear from the United States. Testing, ah, now yes, it's working. <laughs> Morning. Good morning. May it please the court. My name is Brett Rector, and along with my co-counsel, Rhett Reichard, I represent the appellee in this case, the United States government. I will address the threshold issue of abatement. The government is asking this panel to enforce the district court's restitution order for three reasons. First, restitution is a compensatory remedy and is thus not subject to the abatement doctrine. Second, both the language and the purpose of the MVRA strongly counsel in favor of enforcement. And finally, abatement would be particularly- I interrupt you, I know this is your introduction. 
language and purpose. Are those different? Yes, Your Honor, we believe. I think while the language of the statute provides a clear avenue by which this court may approach what Congress's intent was, there is evidence from the legislative history, separate from the language of the statute, that I think will help this court analyze what Congress meant when they passed the MVRA. I thought you said the language was clear. Why would we need to go beyond that? Well, Your Honor, I think going to the Maybe question... Maybe it's not clear? Maybe it's well, not clear. What then? I think a question Your Honor may ask is what I think the government's strongest and weakest positions may be. One of the positions that we must... Right. right. <laughs> um, one of the positions that I think the government must overcome in this case is the unnecessary ambiguity that Congress um, infused into the MVRA when they, in one section of the statute, describe restitution and any other penalty, and then on the other hand, describe restitution as having all the same hallmarks of a civil compensatory judgment. And so in that sense, Your Honor, while the statute's language I think is clear in many aspects, reference to the legislative history provides some help for this panel and the government in analyzing that potential ambiguity. Let me ask you, you used a, a phrase in, in, in your brief, uh, and I'm quoting from it, you described, uh, you used the phrase low latency automated, automatic trading platform. I'm afraid I don't know what that means. Can you, can you? Your Honor, I could shed some, some light on what that means. Any light would be helpful. Our understanding of what uh, Mr. Slynn in this case was doing was taking advantage of shifts in interest rate markets and trading various instruments, financial instruments and stocks, so that he can take advantage of expected shifts in interest rates across the market. His automated platform that you've just described would allow him to do that without manually entering any What trade. does low latency mean? Your Honor, I have no idea. Okay, well, that's in, <laughs> it's in your brief, so I just thought, I thought maybe you would... Your Honor, we're that. quoting from the description that Gordon Slim himself I gave see, during I his see. plea agreement as to what his um, online automated system would do. And how did he profit from his scheme, or what was his... Several different ways, Your Honor. His compensation, at least as laid out in the district court and their factual findings, was tied to the success of this trading platform. The more his automated system led to profits on behalf of minor capital, the more he was paid. So the fact that he had I to... I can understand that. Okay, I've got that. Yes, Your Honor. Um, okay. so moving back into the compensatory purpose of restitution. You said you had three reasons, and I caught two of them. Yes, Your Honor. I think, the, I think the, the chief judge thing. interrupted him. I'm yes, sorry. I just want to make yeah, sure yeah. Right, we yeah. close Thank you, Your Honor, for that. The third reason the government would suggest is abatement, at least in cases like this one, would be particularly unjust where the defendant's voluntary, albeit tragic, suicide has effectively waived his right to appellate review. That would be our third point. Sir, your brief relies heavily on the fact that the uh, – the appeal dealt with, not with his conviction, but with just the reasonableness of the restitution amount. Uh, where in your record, in your procedural history or anywhere, does it actually say that the uh, appeal dealt only with his um, dissatisfaction with the restitution order, that the conviction itself was not being appealed? Yes, sir. On the record at page 21, the defendant's appeal that he filed, and I believe I'm quoting accurately from it, says, appealing from the restitution order and all parts thereof. Our understanding of the phrasing of that is that he keys up only the restitution order and the various issues related to that restitution order as issues for appellate review. I do. You'll concede that if the appeal actually dealt with the conviction, then the abatement would be appropriate. Abatement would be appropriate, but only for penal remedies, not for the, the compensatory restitution order. How does that work? The statute seems to require uh, a conviction as a predicate for the restitution order. So it, 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 where would you point in the statutory language or in case law for the idea that you could have a an order of restitution in a criminal case when there was no conviction left to which it related? Yes, Your Honor. As the Third, Fourth, and Sixth Circuits have noted, the requirement in the statute, AA1, for a conviction references only at the time of sentencing. There's no So if uh, he, uh, imagine he had lived to, for, during the pendency of the appeal and he had chosen to challenge the conviction uh, and also the restitution order and he had successfully persuaded the, uh, the panel of this court that his conviction should be overturned but his restitution arguments didn't end up carrying the day. Yes, Your Honor. In your view that because 
at the time of the restitution order, there was a conviction that the restitution order would stay in place even though the conviction had been reversed? Not at all, Your Honor. The requirement of the statute's language is that at the time of sentencing, the conviction be valid. In cases like Your Honor has just described, where he successfully appeals some error on the part of the trial court in entering the conviction, what the court, I think the appellate court, would properly conclude is that at the time of sentencing, that conviction wasn't valid because of the error the appellate court found. That, I think, would reflect the proper interpretation of that particular section. It's only at the time of sentencing that conviction must be valid. If a subsequent appellate panel decides that that conviction was somehow entered in error, the statutory language would require abatement or at least reversal and vacation of the restitution order. But a little more complicated than just saying the only inquiry is whether there was a conviction in place at the time of sentencing. You're saying a conviction that uh, some later time is deemed valid? Your Honor, again, this is where the government understands it has a hurdle to overcome. But looking at the intent of Congress and the language that was used in the statute, it seems clear that the operation of abatement, which doesn't operate to erase a conviction become, uh, because of some error, needs to be treated differently than the operation of an appellate panel and actually declaring that there was some mistake on the part of the district court. I ask you, if you how far you, I know your third point, we're jumping around a little bit, I apologize for this, but you make the point about the uh, suicide. It, uh, is it your view that in virtue of that uh, development, should be no abatement whatsoever, not just of the restitution order, but also of the underlying conviction? No, Your Honor. The government does not take what we would find to be an extreme position, that in cases of suicide, a conviction need not abate. The waiver uh, of appeal, why does that waiver operate solely with respect to the restitutionary component of the sentence and not the underlying judgment? Your Honor, we think the case law remains relatively clear that even in an exception, for suicide certainly still must fall in consideration of the equitable principles at play as between a defendant and the government and the penal sanctions the government might impose. And what authority do you have that there should be an exception for suicide? I'm not talking about this warm and fuzzy, you know, articles about suicide and mental health. I want to know what legal authority we have to create that exception. Well, as you know, Your Honor, two panels of circuit courts, the 9th and the 11th, have considered such a suicide exception and have rejected them. However, we find that as this is an equitable principle, this court in its equitable discretion has the authority at common law to carve out such an exception if it finds that equity demands it. We would also point this court, those district courts who have been forced to apply the Ninth Circuit precedent in particular, this is United States versus Chong, have noted the great injustice that results from such a rule that does not account for the voluntary suicide of a defendant. In that sense, we think this court should take note of the effects of this case. The effect more unjust? I mean, I understand your point that it's unjust altogether to um, uh, restitution order that's intended uh, to be compensatory to be set aside just because the defendant has passed away. Why is it more unjust if the manner that the defendant passed away is suicide rather than by natural cause? Your Honor, merely the voluntary nature of suicide. We don't mean to address... Do we have any reason to think that he was trying to avoid restitution here or that anyone would take their life to avoid restitution? Is there any evidence of that? No, there's not evidence, there's Your Honor. certainly none in this record, right? There is none in the record before us, Your Honor. But again, we advocate... And, and now let's just talk about sort of common sense and life experience in general. Is there evidence that people take their lives to avoid restitution? That's a bit of a stretch, isn't it? Your Honor, I don't think it's as quite as much a stretch as you might, uh, as you might think, only because the of stretch, this. just not as much as I think. That that's right. Okay. That's right, Your Honor. Okay. And um, I want to respectfully. Push I think it's a big stretch. Yes, Your Honor. And I would respectfully push back on that by using an example, where we have no unjust enrichment in this case. In many cases, there are situations where a defendant has been unjustly enriched because of its criminal activity. Sure. Ten, fifteen. So they're going to take their life. Well, if. Let's say, for example, a defendant is facing a criminal sentence at an advanced age that would effectively end their life. If they are aware that their estate either A, has the opportunity to receive a windfall because of their unjust enrichment, or in cases like this one, avoid... Are you talking about Bernie Madoff? Yes, Your Honor. Enron, Bernie Madoff, um, potentially Arthur Anderson. These are some of the examples that are cited 
in the literature that discusses such a suicide exception, it becomes even more prevalent when you start seeing restitution orders as large as the one in this case. We're talking $10.8 million for which the defendant's suicide would potentially uh, avoid any liability on the part of his family. I find that- you say avoid any liability? There, there are still is civil remedies. I understand they may or may not be equivalent, but I, I think it's a bit over uh, stated to suggest that there would be a, a sort of immunity or a way of completely evading. It, if you think it's a stretch that someone might kill himself or herself to avoid liability, arguably is even more of a stretch when it's to make it more inconvenient for the... Your Honor, there are two points to make to the issue of alternative civil remedies. Those remedies are both inadequate and inefficient. The operation of a statute lim of limitations in particular could, in some cases, prevent any type of civil remedy on the part of a defendant, or excuse me, on the part of a victim to seek some type of civil compensation. More importantly, civil remedies do not account for attorney's fees. So if minor capital in this case sought a common law fraud action, probably in state court, they would not be able to recover the costs of both initiating and then bringing forth that civil, uh, that civil case. The inefficiency argument, though, I think should be of particular concern to this panel. What we're saying with regards to an alternative civil remedy is that a separate court must decide the same factual issues already decided by the district court in this case. The parties must argue the same positions. And actually, it actually puts more of a burden even on the estate. Our alternative allows the estate at this time in this panel to perfect any appeal challenging the restitution order. Appellant's position would require that estate to suffer through both a new trial and then potentially a new appeal. The efficiency of the substitutionary principle proposed by the government allows both a less of a burden on the victim, which again was a purpose of the MBRA, but it still provides the appellate review so important to uh, the appellant's case. And I want to go back just briefly to the suicide concept. Aren't you going to create a situation where you're going to have a lot of factual disputes as to whether or not the suicide was voluntary? Because you know people who commit suicide may not be mentally stable. How are you going to deal with all of those? Your Honor, the proper administrative procedure for that situation, we believe, would be a stay of the appeal, um, asking the government to then seek a ruling, a factual ruling from the district court as to the nature of the suicide. We concede that very rarely will there be cases like this one where the appellant concedes in their very own brief that the defendant committed suicide. So there, there, one aspect is I guess it could be disputed whether the uh, former defendant uh, died, it, whether in fact it was suicide. But the question that was asked focused on another aspect of it, which is it seems to be implied in some of what you say in your brief that there, that wouldn't be the only inquiry. There would also be an inquiry into whether the suicide was in some sense voluntary. Uh, and I'm wondering whether that is what you mean to communicate. And if so, how, what, what, what sense of voluntary you think courts would have to read into that doctrine? Your Honor, part of that reflects what would be the general rule as to what makes a suicide. The government's initial understanding of suicide encompasses a definition of voluntary. I'm not quite clear what an involuntary suicide would look like so if the question is but doesn't voluntary mean someone has the mental ability to know what they're doing yes your honor so if the question is one of mental capacity i would suggest that district courts and trial courts in general address that question in everyday cases including whether or not a defendant Why are you all fighting this issue do you need to win on the suicide issue no your honor we do not at all we suggest it as an important principle that this court can consider in the alternative we believe we may rest both on the language of the statute, the purpose of the statute. This is your weakest argument. I would agree, Your Honor. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, to move into what I would consider my strongest argument, <laughs> yeah, however, okay, there you go. Um, again, looking at the language of the statute, and I think this is important, the language of the statute seems to provide, well, let me retract that and say that it seems to very clearly provide that the restitution order in this case becomes- I would suggest not using the word clearly here, because it, <laughs> it makes me feel bad. If I don't see it clearly, yes, Your I Honor. think it's a close call, so. Let me rephrase that and say it seems to provide that, it, that a restitution order would have the force and effect of a civil judgment. It imbues the restitution order here. It makes it heritable. It makes it assignable. It provides, as the Fourth Circuit noted, a property right in favor of defendant. It connects restitution orders 
with powerful civil collection remedies, things like joint and several liability, subrogation, collateral estoppel. More important, the appellant has suggested, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I see my time has ended. May I have leave to conclude? We would just believe in this case, Your Honor, that appellant has suggested that the doctrine of abatement ab initio extend far beyond its proper scope. In contrast, we think the nature of restitution, the purpose of the statute, and considerations of equity all demand enforcement. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and may it please the court. My name is Rhett Reichard, and I'm counsel for the government of the United States of America. Do you know why the internal investigation costs $2.3 million? Your Honor, that... That's a lot of money. Yes, Your Honor, but it was because Gordon Slynn was a criminal and lied on three separate occasions. He, he was very knowledgeable in what he was doing, and he fabricated and covered up his crime. And so it took extra time and delay. And Do we know how much time it took and how many people they used? And it took at least a month, Your Honor, and probably a couple months uh, from December until March. use a law March. firm to do it? I'm sorry, Your Honor? Do you use a law firm to do it? The or? record suggests that IT professionals, forensic accountants, and uh, financial engineers were hired in order to uncover this ah, fraud. If they cost $2.3 million uh, yeah. in a month or so, uh, they need, they ought to start their own firm and do this. That's pretty profitable. <laughs> yes, Your Honor, but we would suggest that's the, the lowest amount of time. It, it could have operated until from December to March, so um, over the course of, of three or four months. Um, now, now, you're asking us to reject the D.C. Circuit's approach to this, right? Uh, yes, Your Honor. And now, now do, who, do you, who, who wrote that opinion? Do you know? <laughs> uh, the, the judges that wrote that opinion uh, are incredibly bright. Uh, <laughs> Much brighter than I'll ever be. Uh, in, so, so in what, 10 was there, what, what was there? What was? Actually, I think it was Judge Kavanaugh who wrote. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, Your Honor. Wrote the opinion. Uh, what What was the biggest mistake they made? Your Honor, the government's assertion is that that test, the Papagno test, is under inclusive, because it does not contemplate an investigation that instigate a government proceeding, a government investigation and prosecution. It does, by its literal holding, contemplate an investigation that precedes. A government prosecution, but not one that instigates. In the facts that we have before us, which are different from the facts that were relevant in the Papagno investigation. I understand that factual difference, but how do you, if that's your doctrine, how do you tie it to the language of the statute? The language of the statute doesn't have any word like instigation, so where would you, I mean, if, if private investigations can fall within the statutory language, where would a court get the authority to say, well, that's true if it's it has an instigating effect, but not if it doesn't. I mean, where would that come from? Your Honor, the critical word here is necessary. And so the government reads the word necessary to cover costs that would instigate the a critical word was participate. Participate is also another critical prong. Like during. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, they're all pretty important. When you say, you know. <laughs> yes, Your Honor. But to the original question as far as where we get uh, internal investigations that instigate a criminal proceeding, necessary here should have the highest hierarchy because as the Second Circuit noted... That's not, that's not a general view of necessity, do you think? So that imagine that the criminal investigation had been started by a U.S. Attorney's Office and was ongoing. And the U.S. Attorney's Office said to the company, can you help us out here? What the heck happened? And the company goes and hires uh, financial engineers and comes back and tells the government something. That would not have instigated... Are you saying that would not be necessary because the word necessary implies uh, instigation? No, no, Your Honor. So necessary, we interpret to be a broad word that would cover both investigation costs that were required or requested as the Papagno Court held, but also costs that were incurred to instigate a government proceeding. What about, but I, again, I, but you seem to be excluding private investigations that don't instigate. And I'm just trying to figure out at one point, it seemed as though you're suggesting the word necessary would help uh, solve that problem or tell us what, why that would be true. But uh, I'm not sure that's try to understand that line of thought. Is there some other word or some other way, if there were going to be such a limitation, where we would find it in the statute? Well, there, there certainly is a reasonableness inquiry, Your Honor, but to be sure, there are types of investigations that would be excluded under the statute. We argue that the factual scenario in Papagno would still, would still fail our test from the Second Circuit, because that investigation, it had no bearing or connection to the government's investigation or prosecution of the criminal in that case. Unlike here, minor capital, disclosed and shared all of its evidence. 
and it was the but-for cause to the conviction of Gordon Slynn. And we hold word I was, I was interested in, which uh, didn't get a, a lot of play in the briefs, which is the word during. The statute says necessary expenses during participation. Do you agree that implies that the expenses need to be incurred while the investigation is going on? Your Honor, during is a very important word, but during the investigation, it should be viewed as a phrase. And as this court noted, the investigation should incorporate and encompass a variety of investigations. Very often, the federal government will have multiple investigations occurring. The SEC. So your way of parsing the statute as it applies to your facts is that the investigation uh, is the company's internal investigation. It, in, it inco incorporates and encompasses a private victim's internal investigation, yes, Your Honor. But it also incorporates and encompasses multiple, often simultaneous, government investigations from the SEC, the FBI, the DOJ, and it also may even encompass uh, state investigations. So if, if, imagine that what had happened here was the company conducted an investigation exactly as happened, but it didn't do the right thing. It did the wrong thing, and it covered that investigation up. So there were a bunch of expenses that were generated, never communicated to the, to the, to the government. Um, and then the government discovers the crime later, and the company says, wow, you know, we, uh, and maybe the company doesn't even admit it until after the trial is over. And the company comes in at sentencing and says, you know what, we spent a lot of money figuring out what happened. Is the, for purposes of whether there's restitution, do you agree that the investigation can be the company's internal investigation. The investigation, yes, can be. But we would note, Your Honor, in that particular factual scenario that you just proposed, we would suggest the company shouldn't be worrying about restitution orders at that point. They should be worrying about vicarious liability because they would have let the criminal activity occur. I ag uh, agreed with that, but I'm just wondering if the way you read the statute would allow the company to say, we meet the literal terms of the statute, that may also suggest that uh, there might be other ways of looking at that language. Your Honor, if there was a cover-up or if they didn't disclose or share affirmatively, they did not advance a government investigation or prosecution according to the Second Circuit's test, and we would still exclude those types of costs under the statute. The investigation, participation during the investigation or prosecution of the offense implies and suggests that any expense that goes to advancing a government investigation or prosecution should be afforded restitution under the statute. And but at what point are you going to cut that off? I mean, if you go back to the Papagno decision, it talks about, you know, the security guards during the Taylor Swift uh, concerts are participating, but certainly they are not actually performing. So how do you make the distinction as to where this gets cut off? Multiple arguments, Your Honor. Uh, first, there's a limitation in the advancement. So hiring a security guard and, and posting them out in front of the corporate doors or um, increasing your software checks that occur on a monthly or quarterly basis, those are all remedial items that shouldn't be covered because those don't go to advance a government investigation or prosecution. Any expense that does assist and participate uh, during an investigation should be afforded restitution. And it actually it, has to help. I mean, is, is, is it your view that there's a case-by-case -case inquiry that there is actual assistance to the government? So if in this case the government had said, when the company self-reported, thanks, that's really interesting, but unbeknownst to you, we've had your guy under, you know, he's been uh, under our surveillance. We know all of that. You didn't help us at all. You would say not necessary expenses because didn't trigger an investigation, didn't help the government in any way. It was completely duplicative of things. Your Honor, uh, yes, under certain factual scenarios, if there's any evidence, at least in part, you the facts just the way I described them, would you say no restitution for the company or restitution for the company? No restitution for the company because they did not advance a government investigation or prosecution. It, but that's not the factual scenario. So, I mean, the word is, are you reading that because of necessary or because of participate or where are you getting the idea of advancement? Necessary, Your Honor. Uh, again, the Second Circuit's test from Maynard and Amato suggests that we should interpret necessary to cover costs that advance a government's investigation or prosecution. And so anything that's shared and disclosed and advances and instigates and is used by the government should be afforded restitution. And so in the situation you just proposed, Your Honor, uh, those types of expenses would be excluded. And we would also note... So let me ask you the question I've asked everyone else. Okay, the biggest hurdle you have to overcome for us to decide with you in your argument. What yes, Your Honor, the, the, the critical key to the government's position under the second issue is how you interpret the investigation. 
We suggest it should be interpreted broadly but because but, but let's say, let's make sure we're on the same page. So you're saying there's a weakness in your argument there. What what's the but but you're going to tell me why I shouldn't worry about it. What's the weakness in your argument and why shouldn't I worry about it? Because Congress has not explicitly stated what the investigation refers to. And because Congress hasn't explicitly qualified or limited the investigation and because the statutory scheme and framework of the MVRA is designed to cover a broad range of victims who would have a broad range of damages that should be afforded restitution under the statute, the investigation should be interpreted to cover the multiple types of investigations that would occur in order to advance a government prosecution of a I would suggest that another weakness in your argument is that the, I think it's still the MVRA, has another provision not applicable here that is much more explicit about the idea of recovering conse consequential costs like this. Uh, why is that not a hurdle for your argument? Your Honor, it's a slight hurdle, but we would suggest that that argument relies on a weak inference based on congressional action in an, a separate section. And this textual canon is less convincing for a number of reasons here, especially less convincing for a number of reasons here, because that amendment was passed in 2008 in an entirely different act in two separate sections by two separate Congresses 12 years apart that dealt with two separate crimes. And so we would suggest that the comparativeness of these two provisions are different here. And secondly, Your Honor, just under a plain meaning approach, it requires reading subsection B4 to be read in isolation. And read in isolation, it covers internal investigation costs. Seemingly, as appellant has conceded on page 21 of their brief, as long as uh, internal investigation costs participate in the investigation. They're covered under the statute. And, and so we would rest on those arguments, Your Honor, to suggest this court shouldn't adopt that textual canon. How about uh, if uh, uh, very uh, excellent court, the D.C. Circuit, and the judges there ended up viewing the statute one way and some other circuits have viewed it the other way, that suggests that at least the issue is murky enough that reasonable people can disagree about it. And if that's true, why doesn't the rule of lenity suggest that the version of the statute that's more favorable to the defendant? Your Honor, we suggest that the rule of lenity is inapplicable here because out of the seven circuits that have decided this issue, not one has found this statute to be ambiguous. Instead, the plain meaning, legislative history, and the motivating policies underlying the statute support the adoption. See two people arguing, and they both seem very certain. The right response, and but they disagree. The right response is to say, "Well, they all seem certain, but to me, uh, the very fact that they disagree uh, suggests ambiguity." Yes, Your Honor. And, and our second point, the government relies on, is from the the Tenth Circuit in United States versus Sarawak, which holds that the rule of lenity is inapplicable in restitution statutes. My co-counsel made a very convincing argument that restitution is a compensatory remedy. And the well, now, that brings me back to the uh, position that the language of 3663A seems to refer to this as a penalty. How do you get around that? Your Honor, for the reasons my co-counsel uh, rested on earlier, there's plenty of, of bits of evidence in the statute that suggest that this is a de facto civil judgment that should be viewed as a compensatory remedy. And therefore, the rule of lenity would be inapplicable here because court it was or whether it's one of the briefs that says it's really restitution under this provision is really neither fish nor fowl and it does seem as though it's very hard to argue it has no penal aspect it's tied to a conviction it's referred to as a penalty it's very hard to argue it has no compensatory effect I, I, uh, so if it is partially penal why doesn't the rule of lenity kick in even if it has also compensatory functions your honor we would still suggest that the rule of lenity only applies to 100 percent pure punitive uh, punitive sanctions. And here, because there's a critical, at least partly, compensatory nature, we would still argue that it's fully compensatory, that the rule of lenity is inapplicable in this case. Turning to another subject that the government still believes should be uh, addressed by this court is the reasonableness inquiry. Appellant has requested this court to find the, the case and the record here to be, uh, uh, to be not explicit enough and for it to be remanded. We would suggest to this court that first, that's a, qu a question of fact that was decided by the district court and w which was found reasonable, and there's no evidence uh, that proposed by appellant to find that, these, uh, that this decision was clearly erroneous. And secondly, your honors, as this court can note on page one of the record, this is not a, c a complete record before us. This is an abbreviated record. And so we would suggest that it's not appropriate to remand to the district court 
for a complete record. Instead, it's more appropriate to order a rebriefing and rehearing on a, this question of fact with a complete record before us because we don't have a complete record before us here. We only have an abbreviated record. And so instead- well, any kind of a uh, restitution is gonna occur during the sentencing hearing and that's always very, uh, I mean, that's within the judge's discretion because there's never gonna be actual on the record testimony about those kinds of things. So how are we ever gonna know? Your Honor, but there's a, there's a ton of physical and tangible evidence that could be before the district court judge that we don't have in our record, such as timesheets. As uh, the government mentioned earlier, financial engineers, IT professionals, these sorts of folks were hired and presumably they have uh, cases and cases of uh, timesheets that would have afforded, and I see that my time is up, uh, may the government take leave to make one final concluding remark. Uh, just to finish the last uh, answer, Your Honor, we would just suggest that there's uh, enough evidence available to the district court that we just don't have before us today in order to make a decision to remand. Uh, and for, for, the, for the foregoing reasons, Your Honors, the, the government would respectfully request the 23rd Circuit uh, to enforce the district court's restitution order in full and uh, provide for the $2.3 million in investigation costs that should be afforded to the victim in this case, minor capital. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does the appellant have time for three minutes? Now remember, this is for rebuttal. Yes, Your Honor. Yeah, yeah. So what didn't you like that they said? Well, Your Honors, I'd like to turn first to uh, Appley's contention that both the plain language of the statute as well as the statutory purpose support a finding that an order of restitution is compensatory. Now, if you look at the plain language of 3663A, there's in fact no support in there for a finding that the uh, order of restitution is considered compensatory. In fact, as we previously noted, it is specifically referred to as a penalty. And later on in section 3664, it does refer to a hypothetical later civil judgment as compensatory, while notably not ever using that word to refer to an order of criminal restitution. So the plain language of the statute strongly supports a finding that orders of restitution issued under that criminal statute are in fact punitive rather than compensatory. And you uh, want to suggest that it must be one or exclusion of the other. And if the restitution award is paid to the victim and measured by the injury to the victim, how do you argue it isn't at least to a degree, a significant degree, compensatory? Well, Your Honor, in fact, we did not argue that an order of restitution is entirely punitive. We acknowledge that there is a compensatory element. The amount paid in the order of restitution is tailored to the losses suffered by the victim. Now, in some cases of criminal restitution, courts have discretion as to what amount they're going to issue and to whether or not they're going to issue an order of restitution at all, which is further evidence that awards of criminal restitution are, uh, are not simply compensatory in character. But we can also look beyond the plain language of the statute here and look at the overall procedural posture. If this is purely about compensation for minor capital, if making the, the corporation whole is our only goal here, then why are there prosecutors in the room? Why would the United States be acting effectively as a private plaintiff's attorney for a corporation seeking to recover its lost funds? The United States government is not a collections agency with the goal of making the victim whole in this case. Well, Congress it's, has directed the United States government to take a lot of steps to try to protect the interests of uh, victims of crime. So, again, sure that it's the interests of victims of crime necessarily tells you that it is uh, entirely penal. Uh. Well, again, Your Honor, we do not argue that it is entirely punitive. Uh, the government does have some interest in making minor capital whole, but it also has an interest in imposing the imprimatur of state disapproval on the defendant for his misconduct. Now, I'd like to turn briefly to uh, my co-counsel's uh, argument regarding the uh, award of, of uh, $2.3 million for investigation fees. Uh, the government is incorrect that necessary is the most important limiting term in Section B4. Uh, as your honors point out, Congress limited the scope by requiring the expenses be incurred during participation in the investigation. Now, Minor Capital was conducting an internal private investigation when it incurred these $2.3 million in fees. It was simply not participating in the eventual criminal investigation conducted by the United States government. Uh, participation is in that sense the most True important. In the, in the Cummings case also? Excuse me, Your Honor? In the Cummings case, where there was sort of statutory encouragement to conduct internal investigations, wouldn't that have been equally true? Uh, Your Honor, I see that I'm, a, I, that I'm out of time. May I briefly conclude? Certainly. 
Uh, Your Honor, the Cummings case is not controlling in this case, and due to the fact that participation is the most important limiting word in this statute, and that one cannot be said to be participating in something which has not yet begun, this government should, uh, this, this court, excuse me, should find that the $2.3 million in investigative costs are not recoverable under the MVRA. Thank you. Thank you very much. The case is submitted. Well, as is typically the case, this is very difficult. Uh, but we uh, brought our golden coin along. And uh, no, uh, we want to say to, to uh, all the participants uh, what a great job they did. Now, am I supposed to announce the outcome first and then we give advice? Is that the idea? Yeah, let's do it that way. Because I know that's the, if I, we start giving <laughs> advice now, no one's going to be listening. So, <clears throat> but I want to stress uh, uh, how difficult a decision uh, this was. We've been asked to come up with uh, three decisions, uh, the best overall team, uh, the best uh, brief, and the, uh, uh, the best oral argument. Um, and uh, although it was a close call on each of these categories, um, uh, in each one of them, uh, we gave a very slight uh, nod, uh, but a win uh, to the appellants. So congratulations. <laughs> now is the time. Now is the time for some advice. If you're, if you're, if you listen to us, uh, well, we'll start with uh, Judge McLeese. Uh, I thought people were excellent. Um, uh, I would say, I, I, I know uh, I would be thrilled if the actual lawyers appearing in front of us in actual cases uh, did as well at briefing or at argument as you folks did. Uh, people, you know, the, I thought the briefs were very carefully prepared, well thought out, uh, uh, you know, reflected uh, sophisticated legal analysis. Um, and I thought people were well prepared at argument. I thought they were uh, uh, comfortable and poised at the podium. There were not uh, a lot of, uh, really, I can't remember any sort of noticeable mannerisms or tics or things that sometimes can crop up, especially with younger lawyers, actual lawyers, as they're trying to uh, get ready for argument. So I thought uh, people were excellent. Um, uh, I would say if I were gonna give, uh, some more specific comments and focusing, I guess, oh, really both, uh, one overarching comment about both argument and uh, the briefs is, um, I would say the area of greatest improvement uh, thematically would be in uh, strategy and priority. Uh, I think there were, and, and of course reasonable people are always gonna disagree about what arguments are stronger and what arguments you should put in what uh, uh, form. Uh, and in what order and at what length. Um, but both in the briefs and at argument, I thought there were you know, plenty of occasions where the point made first wasn't necessarily the one that was strongest. Or, uh, and uh, that's harder, again, with a brief, you have a lot more time to premeditate that. Uh, with argument, as you're preparing, you should be, I mean, that's part of preparation is, if I'm thinking of a question, uh, what are the 17 things I could possibly say? Well, I'm not gonna get all of those out. What are, what's the order of priority? What's the one that is really, where do I wanna start? Um, and that's both with answering defensive questions and with thinking about what you're gonna say when you stand up. Uh, which is, what is the best argument? Uh, uh, Judge Griffith asked the question, which I used to hate as an advocate. I used to hate it, hate it, hate it. Which is, it's also in interviews I, I never liked it, which is like, what's your biggest weakness? What's the bad part of your argument? Because you feel like you're arguing against yourself, and it's a, it's a very challenging question for a litigant. Um, uh, but you want to think about, like, what are your objectives in your brief? What are your objectives at argument? And if there is, if you know the sticking point uh, is, let's say if suicide, if you thought suicide, that's the hardest part of the case for me, um, you want to think about uh, when am I going to get to that? And uh, uh, so it's time management also. Uh, it's very difficult when you stand up at a podium and people are firing questions at you. It's, it's hard enough to just answer the question, you know, stay on task, listen to the question, answer it. But to be thinking also, well, what else do I want to achieve at this argument? What are my affirmative goals? How do I get from here to there? That's very challenging and difficult even for experienced lawyers to do. But I would say that's, if I, if I were giving you advice about things that I would try to focus on, I would be trying to focus on 
more strategically, thinking more, what, are, why, what am I saying first? Is that what I want to be leading with? And that argument, uh, think, if you're going to be up for a half hour, you would think, if you made a list of three objectives, just three thoughts you want to get out at the argument, it would be easy. You would always be able to do that. And if you have a hot bench, it's actually really challenging to even do that. People keep firing questions in you, and it's very hard to juggle just being in that moment with some sort of strategy. But you want to try to work towards that and work towards uh, their techniques so that you can learn uh, and practice about how to achieve affirmative objectives in argument and how to get, even when you're answering questions, how to control the flow of it. So I can mention one. So um, uh, you're in an area of the argument where It's not that this is a weakness you want to run away from, because you don't want to run away from your weaknesses at argument. You want to confront them and persuade with respect to them. But if one judge is just you know, bogging you down with something that you really think is not important, notwithstanding that the judge obviously thinks it is, you need to answer the questions. You can't just say, well, that's a stupid question. I'm going to move on to something that your colleagues might care about or that anyone reasonably would care about. But um, what you want to do sometimes as a litigant, absolutely, you feel that way. Um, what you can do is after answering the question, you don't have to stop and look that judge in the eye and pause and say, thank you, sir, may I have another? Uh, you can, without a break, just start shifting to what you want to affirmatively achieve. And so there are techniques that you can work on to try to get greater control over getting, making sure you get your affirmative points out. But overall, I would say, again, I thought people did uh, an excellent job. They had thought out, you know, we came up with some hypotheticals that maybe were a little bit new, but a lot of the questions people had thought out, okay, where am I gonna draw my lines? How am I going to defend them? Uh, so there seemed that there had been a lot of careful thought ahead of time, and people generally answered questions pretty directly at the front end. There were a few times when we needed to push a little bit, but generally I thought people did that, which judges really like. Um, so I, 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 it was very impressive. I think people did a great job. Uh, great. And I, I concur in everything uh, Judge McLeese said, and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, add, we'll add some. It, it, it really is, is true that... Uh, even at the D.C. Circuit, we rarely see arguments as uh, poised as we're given today. It really. Uh, uh, just uh, yesterday, what's today? Saturday. Friday. Yeah, Saturday. I'm Today's lost. Saturday. Today's Saturday. <laughs> it was thir Thursday. We had a, a very high-profile case uh, in our court involving a challenge to the, uh, the administration's uh, climate change initiative and had some of the finest lawyers in the country, Professor Tribe, uh, argued in front of us, and it was a delight. And I'm, I'm, I'm not exaggerating. This was, this, this was of a piece with that. You all did an excellent, excellent job. And uh, if, if, if this is something you want to keep doing professionally, I would encourage you uh, to do it. I hope none of you will become transactional lawyers. <laughs> so, so now, just a couple of uh, uh, bits of advice. Uh, and and I, I was obviously trying to make a point by asking you all that, that question about what's the weakest point in your case. Now, I would be careful about uh, taking that as a template for uh, every time you argue a case. I'm not certain I'd get up and say the first thing, you know, Your Honor, look, I know my problem is X, and, <laughs> but you need to be keeping that in mind. And that's, I mean, that's advice that I heard given by one of the best uh, uh, appellate advocates of our generation, uh, the Chief Justice. Uh, when, he, when he speaks about appellate advocacy, that's a point he makes over and over again, that what he wants to hear is he wants to hear some candid acknowledgement that there is a problem with your, if there is one, maybe there aren't no problems with it, because it, it, it increases your credibility in the eyes of the judge. Uh, we know you're zealous advocates. We know you've got clients out there, and you have to say things to please the client. But at, at least for this judge, if, if you appear in front of me, I'm looking for a super law clerk out there. That's what I'm really looking for. I'm looking for someone to help me think through this case. And that's a tough role for you to play both, uh, to be the officer of the court trying to help me think through a tough issue and be a zealous advocate for your client. Uh, and not many do that, that, do that well, but strive for that. And that's what the purpose of that, that repeated question was. And I thought, I thought you did, all did very, very well with it. Um, um, next bit, uh, the facts. I was trying to ask a couple of facts questions. It's tough and it, it because you really don't have much of a record, and, and, and that a lot of those questions that we asked you were unfair because it's not in the record, but I would make the point. Facts are incredibly important. 
Uh, once again, if, if, an, if an advocate comes and shows that he or she has command of the facts, I'm going to be willing to trust you more than if you don't. And I'm looking for someone I could trust here, right? So it establishes credibility. There's another reason to get the facts right. These are real people. Their cases matter. Uh, things happen to them. They did things. The court deserves to need, need deserves or should, should know, and they deserve to be heard. Uh, what happened uh, there. Um, one thing I would suggest that you, each of you work on a little bit. You all did it pretty well, but I think there's a little bit of room for improvement in it, uh, but it comes only with experience, as far as I can tell, and that's to be, as far as you can, to be more conversational. Um, uh, you had lots of information, and it was great that you obviously had a command of the law. And by the way, when you're an advocate, for at least well, I, I shouldn't speak for my colleagues. You know the case better than I do. You know the law better than I do. You've been living with it for a long time. I've been living with it for a while, but not as much as, as you have. So the big challenge is to take all that information you've got and to dumb it down, keep it simple, and make sure, make sure that, uh, that I understand it. And so the, con the conversational tone the extent that you can develop that, and, and very few uh, uh, fellow advocates, at least that appear before me, do that. But stri strive, strive for that. And that may require paring down a little bit, not trying to get so much information out, and, and just, just being a little bit more uh, conversational. If I, can, I tell, can I tell a story? Yeah, I'm the chief judge. I can, I can do what I want. This is great. I love this. We're going to stay here all day. I'm not going to go back. Um, uh, 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 one of my uh, heroes is a fellow that is, uh, you may not recognize the name anymore, my colleagues will, but Rex Lee was the Solicitor General of the United States for a number of years. And I've heard a number of uh, justices say they thought he was among the best, if not the best, advocate. So I'm going to tell you a story that from my time when I was here at UVA. So uh, uh, I knew Rex because we went to the same church in McLean. Didn't know him that well, uh, but I knew him. And um, I got my law review note published on a topic that it turned out he was going to be arguing the case. I sent him a copy of the note, rather thinking rather naively that may, maybe I'd get a citation in the brief or something like that. <laughs> it was silly. It was a bill of attainder case. Anyway, but he called me and invited me to be his guest at the Supreme Court. I had never been in any court before, and now I was going to be the guest <laughs> of the Solicitor General. It was pretty cool. So I'm there. And um, I can remember thinking, I'm going to hear the great Rex Lee. This is awesome. He was petitioner, uh, counsel, I mean, he, I'm sorry, he was respondent. Counsel for petitioner got up, and I, I can't remember the details uh, of, of the case or the argument, except I do remember the, uh, uh, the, the counsel for the petitioner begins, and he was spectacular. I mean, it was unbelievable. He was articulate. He was a law professor from somewhere. He was articulate. He was um, erudite. And I knew he was really, really brilliant because I really couldn't understand anything he was saying. <laughs> it was sort of like my law professors generally. I knew I, was, I knew I was in the presence of this great brilliance, and I didn't quite get it. Then Rex Lee got up, and he began to speak, and I remember the feeling. I was embarrassed. I was embarrassed for him. I couldn't believe it. I said, this is the great Rex Lee? Well, I can understand everything he's saying. Well, you get, you get the point. Uh, um, that's greatness, is taking complex ideas and simplifying it, making it so a well-educated high school student uh, can understand it. I, and I think, I think you all did that pretty well, uh, but that's something to, to, to strive for anymore. Okay, uh, uh, last two points. Uh, for me, uh, and this is going to cut, maybe cut against, uh, oral advocates hate it when I say this. To me, it's primarily about the briefs. And I'll tell you why. Um, uh, it, I'm talking about in real life now, in real life now. Because in real life, it's not moot court, right? In real life, um, we don't decide a case based on how polished or poised uh, the advocates were. We're trying to get the right result based on the facts and the, and the law. And I get to spend more time with the brief than I do. So the, pl the thing that gets me the most, now I like the oral argument because I get to put a robe on, get out of chambers, and see some very talented uh, people. But at least for me, if, 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 you had, if you had 
and it's just my advice, if you had to spend more time on one thing than the other, it, you would be getting the brief right because the clerks are going to read the brief carefully. I'm going to read the brief carefully. I'm not going to have much time with you here. And besides, remember, you can't do anything here that's new. It's not like you can come up and say, you know, on the way in today, I had this great idea. So, so, so the briefs, I think, are really, uh, really, really careful in that regard, really important in that regard. But uh, there you have it. Judge Reeves. Well, I don't have nearly the experience that you all have on the appellate bench, obviously. I want to follow up briefly on what you're talking about with the briefs. Even in my job, I spend a lot of time reading briefs. And so the clearer, the simpler, the easier your brief is to read, the more that we appreciate it. We don't want to get bogged down in great big long complicated sentences or go off on tangents. So always just try to keep your briefs better and do everything you can to learn to be a better writer. Uh, you know, uh, there are seminars that you can go to, and I don't know enough about how they teach you all to write here at the University of Virginia. They must do a pretty good job because you all seem to be pretty good, but, you know, don't ever get complacent about your writing and, and work to make that better all the time. Um, the other thing that I think you all did very well here today is you were at least familiar with the people on the bench. Uh, you know, any time I ever had to go argue at the Court of Appeals at the Sixth Circuit, you know, I made a big point of figuring out which judges uh, on that panel had written opinions about certain, um, you know, if it was a 1983 case or an employment case. So the more you learn about what the judges who are sitting on the panel have done in the past, it may not be a case that you can cite in your brief, but if you get a chance to work it in on oral argument, I think they'll go, oh yeah, that kid's done his homework or whatever. So, uh, and, and it certainly doesn't hurt to have a sense of humor. I think that ties in with what Judge Griffith said about trying to be more conversational. I mean, you know, we all kind of giggled a few times here today, and that happens even in the United States Supreme Court. So don't get yourself so worked up and so uptight that you forget you're a human being and that the people you're talking to are human beings. But other than that, everybody did a spectacular job, and I look forward to hopefully seeing you in court someday. Uh, I agree with Judge Griffith, don't become transactional lawyers. <laughs> and thank you for having us today.